So it's August 29th and it is pretty much my favorite time of year right now because all of the stuff we're growing is in full production and we're just harvesting like crazy, which is fun for me. It's my favorite part of farming is harvesting. Um, and one of the big successes we're having this year is tomatoes. We're getting 350 to 400 pounds a week in about a thousand square feet of growing space. And that's a huge success for me because I've been growing them for uh, like this for about, well, this is my fourth year doing it like this and definitely weren't getting those kinds of numbers the first couple of years. Um, growing tomatoes in a greenhouse is really challenging. Um, it's not as simple as watching a couple of videos. You definitely have to learn by experience and the things we're doing are starting to actually work. So I'm really excited about it. And the other cool part about that detail is we're still having failures. Um, we still have some soil borne disease in some of the tomatoes and that's causing us to pull plants, which is definitely bad for business, but we're still getting crazy good numbers. And a lot of that has to do with the fact of uh, we're growing greenhouse varieties, indeterminate tomatoes, and we're grafting them. So the yield per plant is really high. Um, and uh, a lot of market farmers around the world are doing that kind of stuff. Um, the grafting is a huge part of those numbers. Um, and grafting, for those of you that don't know, is basically you're taking a um, special tomato rootstock and growing it as a separate plant and then grafting your desired variety on top of that. It's sort of like grafting trees, but it's a little more complicated because it's hard to keep the tomato in the perfect humid environment to get um, those two plants to become one. But this is the first year I've had a decent success with it. And um, it's, I think it's a huge part of why we're doing so well with tomatoes. Um, and so we're doing that. We're pruning them to single stem and growing them up a string. We're feeding them once a week. We've been feeding them once a week since about the 4th of July, actually earlier than that, um, mid June or something. And uh, basically we're now seeing the full results of all of that stuff. And um, it's the first year that just everything's gone really, really right. And I wanted to do a little a video that I show you all the different tomatoes we're growing and sort of explain the potential to this as a business because i think you know this video is about tomatoes but it's also kind of about the whole small farm business because tomatoes are sort of the cornerstone of a business like this because when you can grow tomatoes like that you could sell everything else no problem no matter what context you're in for the most part, you know, certain places like California, this might not matter because um, tomatoes are abundant there, but most places, high quality tomatoes like this are not abundant. So just as a reminder, we're in Cody, Wyoming, for those of you that are new here, um, that's a really cold climate and there's definitely no, there's very few tomatoes around here. So. Part of the reason why they're so valuable here is because there's almost nobody that can grow them in their garden and you're lucky to get them in your garden by mid-September basically because the nighttime temperatures are still, you know, in the 40s most of the summer. This last night it was 38 degrees here and it's still August. Um, I was wearing my Carhartt a couple days this week. It's really cold climate. Um, so that's part of the reason why they're so valuable here. But in most Northern climates, tomatoes are still really, really valuable. Um, so if you could grow tomatoes really well, you can grow, you can sell 
a lot of the other really profitable crops like lettuce, pea shoots, herbs, because people are going to come to your booth to buy the tomatoes, but they're going to buy everything else as well. And those other crops are much easier to grow. And again, to give you a little more context, when I'm talking about um, how valuable they are, we're getting between five and seven dollars a pound for tomatoes right now, which might sound crazy to some of you who live in the South or something, but um, organic tomatoes at the store are organic red slicer tomatoes are going for five dollars a pound right now in Cody, Wyoming. And this is a fairly high income area, but um, I would be I bet you that that price isn't that unusual in a lot of northern climates for organic tomatoes. I'm specifically talking about organic. Um, and cherry tomatoes is where we're getting $7 a pound. So that's $5 for a pretty sizable pint. It's about a three-quarter pound pint. Actually, it's really about $6.66 a pound, whatever. You know, um, at the end of the day, what makes money for a farm is yields. It's not necessarily the price. But... There's a lot of potential in this, and so what I'm going to do right now is walk around the farm and sh talk about each type of tomato we're growing and explain a little bit about what's been working well, some of the failures, and then at the end I'm going to go over the potential of this whole thing as a business. So let's get into it. Okay, so we're in our heirloom tomato row in our what I'm calling the nursery right now, because this is half a production greenhouse, half nursery. But these have been growing since we planted them in, uh, I think, April 12th or something of this year. And they're still looking ridiculously healthy. So this is by far the most success I've ever had with this kind of um, crop. And the what these are are uh johnny's seeds greenhouse heirloom tomatoes it's not really a true heirloom it's sort of uh like a hybrid these are bred with traditional heirlooms but with greenhouse genetics um that increases production and reduces disease and stuff. And it's a lot of stuff that's even over my head. I don't fully understand it, but I know that the genetics matter a lot with these kinds of tomatoes. They're very expensive seeds. You know, this is really designed for farmers like me. It's not something you'd want to plant in your garden, but in a greenhouse like this, they produce really, really well. And they're also grafted. Um, <clears throat> so the varieties that we have in this row are, for anybody interested, it's Marbone, Marnero, and Margold. And if you're a market farmer, you've probably heard about those. And you've looked if you looked at Johnny's seed catalog, they're kind of like the centerpiece. They're the coolest looking ones. So this particular one is Marbone. It's a red, sort of French, looks like that French red heirloom. This has been a huge success this year. First year I've ever grown it, and it's uh, absolutely exploded. Huge amount of tomatoes coming out of here. You'll notice they're all green right now, and that's because it's been cold the last couple days partially, but we also don't pick them fully vine ripened. Um, all of the slicer tomatoes we grow, we pick blushing. So we're looking for this guy right here. You probably can't see on the camera, but he's blushing. I'll get a close up of that and show you. Um, so I would pick, the, um, tomorrow is when we're going to do our final pick for the week and I'll pick this guy. Um, it's looking like a fairly light pick tomorrow actually, but that's cause it's been, it was 38 degrees last night. So they're not going to be ripening a lot, but we've already picked a truckload from this bed already this year. We're getting anywhere from 30 to 50 pounds of tomatoes out of this 40 foot bed every week. We've been getting that since about the 4th of July and it's almost the end of August. We're going to keep these going for another couple weeks and then we're going to flip them to winter lettuce or cilantro. I haven't made up my mind yet, but this is a huge moneymaker. We're getting $6 a pound for these at the market and selling out perfectly. And whatever we don't sell, which is almost nothing right now, we freeze and sell in the winter for $4 a pound as a canned tomato option because 
these tomatoes work really well frozen in stoops, stews, curries. It's just, it's one of my favorite things uh, that the farm produces is those frozen tomatoes. But honestly, we've been selling so much of them, we don't even need to worry about it. And um, huge win. The plant is really um, vegetative, so you see all these. There's a lot more like um, suckers coming off of these, and we do prune these. We take the suckers off every week, but um, there's a lot of weird little suckers that show up at the bottom. But these plants are probably 15 feet long each now, you know, because we've been lowering them and leaning them every week. Um, so they've been going for a long time, but it's really unusual to have them looking this healthy this late in the game. You know, first couple times... I grow, I've grown them. There's been blight, all sorts of problems on them, and they're pretty much done by this time of year. So it's just amazing that they've, they're going this well this late in the season. And that's kind of the name of the game with indeterminates. If you can keep the plant healthy for a really long period of time, that's when you can really make a lot of money with them and grow a lot of tomatoes. So that's the heirlooms. Let's move on to cherry tomatoes. All right, so now we're in our cherry tomato row that we planted in April. And this has been the best crop of cherry tomatoes I've ever grown by far. And again, these are grafted tomatoes, greenhouse variety. It's called Sakura. We did only that variety because I've had the most success with it in the past. And the real reason I want to grow it is because look at how long some of these fruit spurs are. These aren't actually that long. Um, some of them have been two feet long. And uh, yeah, like this guy right here. Look at that. That's almost, that's longer than my forearm. So there's a truckload of tomatoes on one plant. Um, we've been getting almost the same amount of yield on cherry tomatoes as slicers, which is incredible. Not something that happens with every variety, but this is Sakura. It's a delicious tomato. It's a really big one also, so it fills a pint really well. Um, but the amount of yield we're getting in here is in incredible. The plants are a lot more vigorous uh, than your slicer tomatoes, meaning they're going to grow a lot longer. I think these are probably 20 feet long by now, but we've just been picking truckloads of them every week. It's been about 30 to 50 pounds of these a week since 4th of July. And the nice thing about cherries is they produce for a little bit longer, you know, two, three weeks longer. They're ready earlier than the rest of the tomatoes. Um, and they sell just as well. They don't draw quite as many people to your booth, but, um, huge money maker. And they're also delicious frozen when they are frozen and you put them in a curry in the, in January, it's to die for because it's so sweet. Um, the cherries are definitely sweeter than all the other tomatoes. So um, huge money maker, and it's basically the exact same technique as we grow all the other tomatoes, except uh, these have a lot more suckers. So like right here is where we cut a sucker probably like two months ago at this point. Um, they have a sucker on every single branch. Um, I'm not going to go into exactly how we prune in this video. It's really too complicated to explain in a video like this, but um, all the techniques that we use to grow tomatoes are in that Never Sink Farm course. And a lot of the stuff I, that are, is in that course is uh, the single stem pruning method and uh, lowering and leaning. A lot of that stuff is out there on the internet anyway, but we do it exactly like Never Sink Farm and it works phenomenally well. Uh, and again, we've been feeding them with this, um, this alfalfa meal mix uh, once a week. And that's made a huge difference in, I think, how healthy the plants are. These are going to produce like this for another two, three weeks at least. And there's almost no disease on these. So huge success. Um, but when you can grow tomatoes with this kind of fruit spur on them, when cherry tomatoes, there's probably, there was probably... A pound and a half of tomatoes on one fruit spur. I mean, that's just incredible for cherry tomatoes. If you've ever grown 
like super sweet 100 or something like that that actually yields really well almost as much as this but the fruit is all over the place you have to spend you know five times as long to harvest the the tomatoes and then they split these ones don't split um they're just delicious and they're really fast to harvest that's another thing you know with a business like this you got to make sure you you grow the right varieties because if you take too long to harvest them that just costs you more money especially when you're paying people you know a really good wage so this is a really profitable way to grow them and uh i want to grow another bed of them next year just because this was such a success so sakura is our cherry tomato and it's been a huge win let's move on to paste tomatoes all right so now we're looking at my favorite part of the farm at this moment right now because these are our granadero paste tomatoes that's another greenhouse variety from johnny's and it's their kind of roma greenhouse type so it's an indeterminate it, it grows really vigorously like almost like a cherry tomato like the plant is so long that's why they're so kind of leaned over right now um, they get lowered a lot but it is absolutely the best crop i've ever grown of this uh, i'm so excited about it we're getting like 50 to 70 pounds a week and i think it's going to go up we just started picking them really heavily this week and i think it's going to go up um it's almost producing like cherry tomato spurs but these weigh a lot more and i love these kinds of tomatoes because there's much less water um and I kind of like that better. I, that's why I don't really like those big red tomatoes that much because it's super watery. Um, especially because I, I like using tomatoes in like sauces and stuff. Um, that just excites me more. I don't know. I love curry um, and making tomato curry and stuff. Um, and these are better for that. They're just a meatier, more acidic flavor. Um, and we also have got another one that's called Tyrin paste. That's also a Johnny's variety. And it's sort of like a greenhouse San Marzano, which is actually, I haven't tried it yet. I need to try the, the actual flavor. Um, we've got some ripening on the counter, but I have a feeling that one's going to be a game changer, but these are really productive. Like this is over a pound right here on one fruit spur, huge amount. And this whole plant has tons of them. Um, and just look at down the whole row. I mean, they're, they're all, glistening in the sunlight right now it's just gorgeous um and we're probably not going to lower these a whole lot either because we still only got like a month left but um big big win um there's so much fruit on these that they're starting to slip um which is sort of a bummer they, they slip on the on the string a little bit when they're too heavy um, but that's that's not a big deal um but these are all grafted um these worked really, really well with the grafting. I could tell that that's increasing the volume of tomatoes a lot. Um, and we're still selling these for $5 a pound, um, which I kind of am shocked that people are paying that. But, you know, when you put the amount of effort and stress and when you've actually gone through the process of growing them and you have a success, I'm a lot less likely to give a discount on something like this because it's not easy. I mean, it's just really, really challenging, very, very stressful um, when you know what is involved. If you spend all the money uh, paying somebody to prune them, you know, uh, this is the first time I've been really, really successful on them. So I'm not really excited about discounting them at all. And plus, whatever we don't sell will freeze. And these are great as that frozen canned tomato I was talking about. But um I'm so excited about these. They're fun to grow, uh, really easy to pick, and they're just gorgeous. So like all of these are gonna get picked tomorrow. We're picking these kind of like three quarters ripe. Um, I kind of like that, because I still like them to be fairly firm when I'm selling them, but they don't taste very good when they're just blushing. And these are little details that you learn when you start to grow them yourself and stuff. But um, And that farm course talks a lot more about how to pick them and stuff but this is a huge win um you know when you can grow all these different types of tomatoes too you're, dr you're drawing four different kinds of customers right every customer likes a different tomato and it's just 
brings it's like makes your booth or your business a magnet for people because um, everybody loves tomatoes not everybody but i mean more people love tomatoes than pretty much every other vegetable at least in america and it makes it it makes your business work really really well when you can grow this kind of stuff and again we've got a lot of failures in this greenhouse this we're doing really well but there's still a lot of things that went wrong so that's what actually really excites me because everything i'm talking about can get better so there's potential in this to get even better than the numbers i'm talking about and um there's already growers doing way better than me um that that like that never sink farm that guy is incredible they they grow tomatoes way better than me right now and so their numbers are probably a lot better than mine but i'm just excited because this is the first time I've actually been really, really successful at it, and it's just showing me the potential in this business. All right, so now we're looking at our slicer, red slicer tomatoes, which is sort of the crown jewel of the farmer's market booth. This is what draws everybody to your booth. Even those heirloom tomatoes, as much as I think they're cool, and they're, we've got three different colors, the purple, yellow, and red, these draw the people to your booth more than anything because everybody wants a BLT. And it, it kind of frustrates me sometimes because it's like people will come to your booth and they'll buy one tomato and they won't buy anything else. But like, it's honestly not my favorite food at all. Um, it's not that great a flavor. Like the greenhouse varieties that we're growing, it's, it's kind of watery. Um, it tastes good on a BLT, and I love a good BLT. But it's not really what I go nuts for. It's not my favorite food that we grow. Um, mine is actually celery. I go crazy for celery. But... Uh, local celery the, the kind of celery we grow just tastes so much better than the store this tastes way better than the store for sure um and it's almost like every single tomato tastes a little bit different it's something about i mean i couldn't even tell you i have no idea why each one tastes differently it, it, there's all sorts of factors like the weather the sun um the watering these taste great don't get me wrong but I don't know why people go crazy as crazy for them as they do, but they do go crazy for them. And that just means you got to grow a lot of them. And these are also the highest yielding tomato that we have pretty much. Although the heirlooms probably were more and the cherries were it. They almost all yielded about the same this year, which is just insane. But you don't, I don't expect that. I usually expect these guys to just be pumping. And this is our second crop. Um, so they're just starting to come on really, really strongly now. Um, and that's how we're getting the 300 to 400 pounds a week. With just that greenhouse, it was about a 200 pounds a week-ish. Um, in that other greenhouse, we were doing 80 to 100 pounds a week in two 40-foot beds. This is one 70-foot bed. But you might notice that we've had to pull a lot of plants in here because there's been a soil-borne disease um, but we still have most of the beds still producing and we're getting 60 pounds a week out of this one at least and more than that I think I can't remember now but these are hugely productive um, these are all Johnny's um, hybrid slicers uh, they're I think this one's Cayman is a new variety they came out with this year and I really liking it so far um, there's you know, I try a couple different varieties every year for this type of tomato and almost doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, the flavor is almost the same, but, um, and I'm still learning. I'm pretty new at this, full disclosure. You know, there's people that have been growing greenhouse tomatoes for 20 years and way, no, no way more than me. But um, so far, I've not seen a huge difference in flavor, but um, it's more about shape and yield and stuff like that and like shippability and stuff because you definitely want a tomato that's not going to turn into jello by the time you go to market and these have been really really solid so i'm happy with those but as you can see we're still doing the same thing we're pruning the bottom leaves 
we're probably not going to lower these very much because we're only got about a month left of production on them and uh, we'll flip this to uh, winter crops also can't remember what it'll be now um, but yeah huge success and again we pick them blushing so we're kind of looking at one that's about to blush this guy's going to be ready tomorrow when we pick um, but yeah we don't wait till they get totally red when it's super hot out they'll get a lot redder on the plant earlier um, but when it's cold at night they don't ripen as fast but there's still almost the same amount of tomatoes ready on the plants it's just harder to tell on the camera right now just because you can barely tell there's a little bit of red and that takes a lot of experience to be able to pick them but the picking isn't really that big of a deal it's more of the getting the soil right is the real challenge and we also did a soil test this year uh, or actually last year and i amended the whole farm according to the soil test with the right calcium and stuff and i think that's another reason why we're doing so much better and that's just going to get better over time that's a huge part of growing anything is getting your soil right and that's that's a challenge but um you know the amount of food that's getting produced in this tiny little area is absolutely incredible um and so let's move on to the next segment so the reason I made this video wasn't necessarily just to talk about our awesome tomato production this year. Um, we, even though I am really excited about that and proud of what we're accomplishing, it's more about I'm excited to share the potential of this business because we're doing 350 to 400 pounds of tomatoes on a thousand square feet of space, which is nothing. That's a very small space. And the, what that means is if you could grow a crop like that in a thousand square feet, you could do it in Chicago. That's where I'm from. I'm from the suburbs originally, and I lived in the city for a couple of years. And you could grow the, this kind of tomato production on a parking lot, you know, in, on the south side or something where real estate would be cheaper. And then you could grow your lettuce and all the other stuff too. The point is you could do this anywhere. Um, I don't mean literally anywhere, but I'm talking about really Northern climates, but in, in a lot of different contexts, you could do it in cities, suburbs, the middle of nowhere where I am at basically, cause I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere. And that makes a decentralized food system a lot more possible. You know, and I'm not really a Nazi about what that looks like. I don't really care if, the, if like, 100% of our food is decentralized, but I would like to see more of it decentralized and less dependence on California and Florida, especially for vegetables. That's really my wheelhouse. Um, I don't necessarily think that you're going to have uh, local beef absolutely everywhere in the world, but... Vegetables is possible and the freshness of locally grown vegetables is I think a huge game changer for health and just quality of life everywhere. But it, just as a business, this has a lot of potential. If you do the numbers on a thousand square foot apartment in a city or something, which is a very small apartment, that if you're charging a $2,000 a month rent, which is very expensive, um, you know, around here, rent is really expensive around here, which is weird because we're in Cody, Wyoming, but, um, you know, a, a, a 1200 square foot apartment is going for $1,300 a month in rent here. So let's just say you're in, uh, like a city like San Francisco and you get a thousand square foot apartment for $2,000 a month. That brings in $24,000 a year in revenue. What I just explained with the tomatoes, if you did tomatoes and winter lettuce in a northern climate like Chicago, and you did interplanting with beets, all three of those things in the thousand square feet, you could raise $32,000. And that's based on my numbers that I've actually seen on my farm. Uh, I think you'd probably do better than that. But, um, I'm just going off of what I've experienced. And so that kind of revenue 
per square foot is something that can happen in a lot of different contexts. My point is there's actually a business here that can make a lot of people money and make this kind of food accessible to people because if you could get the tomato thing right, you can make a lot of other crops profitable, but it's harder to do that when you don't have a draw to your business. You know, the tomatoes are like advertising, free advertising. I don't pay for advertising because people come to my booth once they've tasted the tomatoes and they see that I know that I have them. I don't need to advertise. People just come. And I think that's the case in a lot of different contexts. So this style of farming can produce a ton of food in a very small space. And I also have a gardening course that I've put together with a friend of mine over the past couple of years that I teach similar techniques for your own backyard where you can grow a truckload of food in two or 300 square feet. Not necessarily just tomatoes, but all sorts of other stuff because <clears throat> the tomatoes are just a part of my business. They draw people to my booth, but they also produce a lot of food in a small space. I could teach you how to do that with crops like celery, carrots, lettuce, turnips, all sorts of other stuff on a very, on a very small space in your backyard. They could produce pretty much all your own vegetables for your family at home because the methods that I'm talking about are even in this video are all about growing a ton of food in a small space. So if you're interested in that, check that out at the link in the description. And if you like this video, please subscribe and share with somebody that might be interested in anything that I'm talking about here. So I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you in the next one.